Holy Gospel this morning is according to Matthew, the third chapter. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. And I think I've got a couple young people that might want to come up here and join me for a minute or two. I have something amazing for us today. Amazing, amazing, the most amazing thing you've ever seen. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> huh? We take this stuff for granted, but can you think of anything more amazing than water? I can't. <laughs> Where would we be without water, right? We wouldn't be living if we didn't have water. You know that astronauts, when they go looking for life on other planets, what do they look for? Water. Or traces of the fact that there might be water because we know that you can't have life without water. Did you know that you can go longer without eating than you can without water? You can go for many, many days and not eat and still live, but you can only go a few days without water before we get really, really sick. Am I making you thirsty yet? <laughs> you can take a drink if you want. You want to take a drink? I'll take a drink. What does water taste like? It doesn't really have a taste, does it? It doesn't taste like milk or juice or anything, but is there anything better than water to drink? I'm going to make these guys thirsty for water. Mm. There's nothing more refreshing than water. And can you think about all the ways in which uh, water is all around us. Like right outside today, I hear there were some deer playing in the water mm -hmm. out in front. Right? They were playing in the what? What do we have out on the ground right now? Water in the form of snow, right? Water can be frozen in ice. Do either one of you like ice cubes in your water? I do too. I love to chew on ice cubes and let them melt in your mouth. Yeah. The ice, frozen water, snow, you can make snowmen with water, right? And then it turns into steam, and, it, and you can see it in the air as it's steamy. We, I just got back from vacation, I got to go on an airplane, and uh, you fly through the clouds. We were in a cloud high on top of a mountain, weren't we, Steve? And it was like raining, the cloud is raining, there's water all around us. Water is everywhere. What's your favorite thing to do with water? Huh? Swim in it. Yes. Splash in it. Enjoy it. It cleans us. It uh, replenishes us. It nourishes us. It does amazing things. I don't think there's anything more amazing that God created than water. And we often take it for granted and we don't even think about it. And one of the ways, come on over here with me, please. One of the ways in which we celebrate water in church is through baptism. So we're standing at the font. We moved it over here for the morning as we remember how Jesus was baptized. Do you want to stick your fingers in there too? Want to play in the water? You were both baptized. I know you were, right? And when you were baptized, that water was splashed on your head. And then we also made the sign of the cross to remind you of all the promises that God gives us. So God gives us the gift of water in many ways, including the gift to remind us that we are loved and that we are God's children. So I'm going to have you repeat after me as we pray. Are you ready? Thank you, God, for the gift of water. Thank you, God, for the gift of water. And thank you, God, for the gift of baptism. Thank you, God, for the gift of baptism. Now, right, you get your fingers wet and take it back and share some of that water with your family, okay? <laughs> or, yeah, nobody's sitting close enough for me to <laughs> You go up, feel free to splash anybody you want. <laughs> You're all worried too. Right? <laughs> 
We are beginning Epiphany. We are celebrating with the baptism of Jesus. And our theme for Epiphany as we go through these coming weeks is going to be God's greater than that. God is greater than that. I don't care what that is. I'm confident that God is greater than that. This understanding or this theme or idea has been rolling around in my head for a couple of months now. In November, I went to a continuing ed conference, and the title of it was Change, and then in parentheses, Almost Everything. But in our opening worship, Pastor Kelly Chapman, who is a pastor up in the Minneapolis area, talked about how he was wrestling with the theme of this conference and what that meant. And he came to the realization that God is not an almost God, right? God is an everything God. God is all in. There is no holding back when it comes to God. God is more than we can possibly imagine. God's bigger than our greatest understanding of God. God is greater no matter what. No matter what we think, know, understand, experience, believe, God's going to be greater than that. God, for example, loves all people, right? God is for every single person. All times, always, all places, no exceptions. We always want to draw a line or make a circle. But as a seminary professor, I still remember said, every time we try to draw a circle and keep other people out, we'll find ourselves on the outside as well. God doesn't draw lines. God doesn't draw circles. God doesn't make exceptions. God is for every person. And when God says everyone, God means everyone. And God isn't a God of mostly grace or grace except for a certain circumstance. God is all about grace. God is love all the time for everyone in every situation. God is also faithful all the time. God isn't faithful unless you do something really bad or anything like that. God is faithful. Our faithfulness, of course, always seems to reach a limit, but God's faithfulness is always there. We were in, on vacation. We were in Hawaii this past week, and until I got there, I didn't know it was the rainbow state. But if you've been there, you know about that. Every day we saw at least one, often several rainbows. God put rainbows in the sky. We read this in the book of Genesis, not to remind God that God's going to be faithful to us, but God put rainbows in the sky to remind us that God is always faithful. We're the ones that need reminding because God is greater than that. And God is also a God of forgiveness. God doesn't forgive unless it's too bad or, or too extreme, God forgives. In fact, God has forgiven before we even know to ask for forgiveness or to remember to ask. We're told to forgive what? 70 times 7? That's a minuscule compared to God's great forgiveness. And I can go on and on. God is always greater than what we know. God is always greater than our experience. Uh, think of the time in which you felt the most loved or were able to love people with your whole heart and mind. That's just, it's just a tiny bit of experience of how great the magnitude of God's love is for us. No matter what we understand or see or experience, God's going to be greater than that. God also has this ability to have a perspective and a way of understanding that always is constantly challenging us as well, right? We think we know and we think we understand and then God comes and expands that horizon or often turns what we understood upside down. Baptism, I think, is just one example of that. The, the idea of a baptism is, has its roots, of course, in ancient Judaism. It was an ancient purification ritual. And John the Baptist made it an act of repentance, an opportunity for people to, to repent of the things that they had done wrong. All well and good, a good, solid, firm ritual. And then Jesus comes along and turns it on its head. And makes it greater than that understanding. Now we're not just being baptized with water. He's being baptized and we are in turn baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it remains, of course, a reminder of God's great forgiveness of all of our sins. But it becomes more than that as well. It's greater than just a ritual for repentance. It's a reminder and a ritual as well in which God says, you're mine. You've always been mine. You always will be mine. 
I've claimed you as my own. I've called you to be my son and my daughter. And I am never, ever, ever going to let you go. God tells us that in baptism. But don't get me wrong, it doesn't happen in baptism. It happened long before baptism. But God uses baptism as that reminder that we've been called and claimed and held as precious children of God, always, always to be held in the arms of God. And it's still more than that as well, right? God promises us salvation in the gift of baptism and the sacrament. We didn't even know we wanted to be saved. We didn't even know what salvation was. And God is already giving that to us freely, without reservation, calling us and claiming us because God loves us. Baptism affirms all these promises, all these gifts that God has given us. All these things in which God says to each of us, you are my everything, no matter what. But we, of course, we want to make it less than, because that's how we're about. So we think, well, baptism, you have to be baptized, right, in order for something to happen. You have to be baptized in order for you to, to, to receive these promises. And no, God's always greater than that. So baptism becomes this symbol for us, this understanding of everything, everything that we can understand, and then a recognition, but it's still more. It's still more than that of how we are called and claimed and just as God called and claimed Christ in that baptism and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And God in turn gives us the instruction. You remember that as well, right? At the end of Matthew, go and make disciples, baptizing them in my name. Go to the ends of the earth. God is always beyond us. God is always greater than us. God is always more than us. God is greater than that. So what is it then that stops us from living fully into this invitation from God? What is it that always seems to get in our way from living fully into these baptismal promises that we have been given and that are ours each and every day? Last year, you uh, received a star. And many of you, as you got another star this morning, you were telling me you still have your star, and I'm glad to hear that. You've perhaps carried it with you, and it was a star that had a word on it, right? And you were invited to just let that word live in you. One of the ways in which God could live in you over this last year. Today, I've got another star for you. Hopefully, you all got one. But um, you'll notice this star doesn't yet have a word on it. Because that's because today I want you to think about what that one thing is or what that greatest obstacle is in your life that keeps you from living fully into your baptismal promises. What is it that stops you from fully living into that call and that claim that God has in your life? Maybe it's an illness that you're struggling with and the fact that your body just doesn't do uh, what it once was able to do and you don't know what the the future holds for you, and so that causes you worry and anxiety. Or maybe you struggle with an addiction of some kind. Maybe it's a chemical addiction, but there are many other kinds of addictions as well. Anything that we do too much of that we know is not healthy for us. Maybe you struggle with accomplishment. Maybe you feel like no matter what you do, it's never enough, or that you as a person are never good enough to receive all this abundant grace of God. Or maybe it's something that you did at some point in your life and you still regret it. You haven't been able to forgive yourself for it. Or maybe you've been hurt by somebody else and that pain, you just can't seem to get rid of that pain or, or forgive that hurt as well. Or maybe there's a part of you that you struggle with that you don't like. We call that our shadow. We all have parts of us that that we just wish we weren't quite that way. You know what I mean? Maybe that's what keeps you from living fully into your baptismal promises. Or maybe it's a lost dream. Maybe you feel guilty because you have doubts and because you're not as faithful as you would like to be. Whatever it is that's broken or lost or missing in your life, whatever it is, I want you to, to contemplate for a moment what that obstacle is. <coughs> And then in just a moment, I invite you to come forward. And I'll invite you to come and, and uh, bring that star to the font. 
I'm going to put some pens up here. And what I'd like you to do is take that star and write in one word or two, just enough so that you'll remember. Although I doubt you'll have a problem remembering, right? But write one word that reminds you of what that obstacle is in your life that keeps you from living fully and completely as a beloved child of God. And then, on the other side of your star, I want you to write God's greater than that. Because God is greater than that. Whatever that obstacle is, whatever it is that holds you back, God's greater than that. And if you turn that obstacle over to God, God can do great things. And you can discover that. And you will indeed know how God is greater than that. So on one side of the star, whatever your obstacle is, on the other side of the star, a reminder, God's greater than that. And then before you leave the font, do as our children did. Dip your fingers. Make the sign of the cross to remind yourself again of the promises that you were given the promises that are yours each and every day and each and every moment of every day. And then take that star. Maybe you want to put it with your star from last year or find a new place for it. But whenever you see it, let it remind you that no matter what, no matter what your struggle, your obstacle, the difficulty, God is greater. 